Lecture 3, Norms and Forms. In 1994, I had uh, the opportunity, I was invited to Hanoi, Vietnam. And I arrived there having very little knowledge of anything about uh, this area and was surprised by what I found, uh, the diversity of what I was found. Ostensibly, what I was there to do was to work with a team uh, to plan for the uh, development uh, and the preservation of this historic district, uh, characterized by these very long and narrow lots. You can see by this fabric that uh, these very long and narrow lots have the interesting problem of how do you circulate from the front to the rear. and some of these buildings have gotten quite tall uh, because if you build overnight, you are allowed to keep it uh, at that height uh, as long as no one catches you building it during the day. So an interesting thing was happening in this very historic original part of the town of Hanoi, Vietnam. Um, and we can look at that here. This is one of the market streets. Uh, and you can see very narrow storefronts. And in the distance, you can see some of the towers, the towering high rise, uh, but still very narrow uh, because of the way the lots were laid out. Um, in 1994, the United States lifted the embargo that had existed on northern Viet Vietnam or the country of Vietnam. Uh, you will recall there was a war. Uh, the French colonized Vietnam and the Vietnamese, especially based in the north, rebelled against the French uh, to eliminate the colonial rule of the French. And they used communism as their rallying principles in order to mobilize the, the war against the French. Because communism was a threat to United States interests, the United States got involved in the war um, by the way, they didn't really care too much about Vietnam itself, but they did not want the communism that had gained a stronghold in China to spread throughout Southeast Asia and eventually take over Indonesia with its strategic materials and strategic water uh, navigation ways between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And so when I got there, uh, the uh, economic boom had not yet gotten... Uh, going. And so this area was about to undergo a great deal of economic stimulation, and indeed it has in the past 20 years. Uh, the other thing I found um, was a very interesting remnant of something very different. And I found this, um, this building is very close to where I was staying at the time. Uh, by this lake. I believe this is the building uh, that is pictured in that slide. And so you can see uh, in, inscribed on the facade, uh, you will recognize French. Uh, this picture is from uh, the time of French colonial reconstruction of Hanoi. And so you'll see much of Hanoi uh, is very different from the long narrow lots called tube houses. Uh, this, uh, these other parts of Hanoi are the French parts. In addition to the, the indigenous and the French part, there is another part of town that is characterized by a very different style that was imposed um, during the communist uh, development um, a, a modernist pattern of development that uh, is characterized by the Soviet Union style of modernism. And you'll see um, lots of uh, slab style buildings. Uh, this is the government complex. It's a very stark modernism, um, much reviled uh, in the present time. And so you have three very distinct overlays of the city. And you can see the pattern when you zoom out. The historic part here with some uh, avenues cut through. The, the French quarter that is very ordered, um, 
pattern of the European city and then the Soviet section um, that has a different order to it and this major highway which is the national road uh, of Vietnam and so we're going to focus in on the French part um, the French like many European countries made it their business to spread their control and their reach around the globe uh, and it was seen as a moral obligation especially in France. France was considered the vanguard of rational modern progress for humanity and so they felt an almost moral obligation to uh, play a very significant role in places all over the world including in Africa. Uh, the history of colonialism is interesting uh, background to all of this because in, 18, in the 1880s the king of Belgium called for a meeting in Berlin and he said listen we're gonna keep running into each other all around the world unless we figure out a system ahead of time of how we are going to divide up uh, the non-European colonies around the world and so in this meeting they established a few rules uh, that basically determined how you would gain colonial control over different parts of the world. It had to do with gaining the allegiance by force or coercion of local leaders and so the scramble began and by 1913 the world had been divided up and here you see French uh, African holdings in blue and uh, the rest of the world was similarly divided up uh, South America and Asia would there are similar maps associated with those areas as well the French developed a method of organizing cities that you may be aware of from your history of architecture in the 1850s Houseman cut boulevards through the slums of Paris in order to create uh, these visual corridors that would connect the major monuments of Paris. This was based on an older idea that Pope Sixtus V applied to the city of Rome. Uh, it gained a great deal of popularity. It became the organizing principle for not just Paris but the countryside around Paris and you can see off to the lower left of this uh, view the palace at Versailles which uh, was also organized according to these visual corridors cut through the city and the corridors that cut through the city were also an opportunity to redevelop the physical fabric of the city with new building types uh, the shops the apartment buildings that line the boulevards of Paris were the basis of a new bourgeois middle class that uh, for recreation they would walk the streets and socialize and this kind of shows uh, the celebration of that new way of life that was really considered to be a modern uh, innovation that uh, the new era would be characterized by this kind of socializing in public space and indeed this has come to be mostly true the section through the apartment house shows uh, a very interesting social stratification with the kitchen on the bottom floor, the piano nobile, the main floor uh, above. Uh, we would call that the second floor, but in most of the rest of the world that is called um, the first floor. And uh, above that you have uh, a family with babies, um, kind of a middle class labeled number four and above that you get ever more uh, lower degrees of wealth uh, the rent the, you must pay the rent scene in room number six and then finally very up uh, at the very top uh, in the attics you have the poorest the artists the struggling um, poor working poor and um, the, the very poor of Paris and so they're all in one building. Um, here's a view of how Paris was cut up and you, as you might uh, guess there was a great deal of destruction involved in cutting these new boulevards uh, and building new buildings. And you can see this in Kostov's 
uh, visualization of how a new boulevard was cut through. And this style of development either was proliferated throughout the world, either by the French directly or by emulation of others. This is um, in Iran. Um, and this is in Cleveland, uh, the Chicago's World Fair in Chicago, you may have heard of it, in 1893, developed the white city idea and it forged a new movement called the City Beautiful Movement. Pretty much every city in North America has some uh, imprint of this idea of the city beautiful, of public space and a set of buildings around that public space that exudes the uh, high ideals of democracy and civic pride. Uh, and so in Paris, uh, the architecture and the urban form were very much connected. At the end of every one of these visual corridors of the new boulevards, it was important to place an architectural monument. This is one of the most uh, remarkable ones. This is uh, uh, the Paris Opera by Charles Garnier, and it uh, gives this glorious Baroque facade at the very end of a boulevard. And here's a very similar building, uh, the Hanoi Opera uh, in Hanoi. Um, in the Paris situation, the boulevard was cut through the fabric. Uh, new buildings shown here in blue uh, were built to line these boulevards and define the space of the boulevard. And at the very end, the Paris Opera House would uh, be the visual anchor of the whole thing. And there it is uh, in an aerial view, the Paris Opera House. The section cut through the Paris Opera House is a very interesting uh, historic artifact of an architecture that is all about the spectacle of performance, not just in the Opera House itself with its vast uh, stage infrastructure uh, and the audience hall, but the performance of the audience uh, before and after and during intermission, the entry sequence from the front steps up through the lobby, up through a series of cascading balconies uh, and halls and stairways with landings. It was all designed for the new uh, social practices of being uh, occupying public space in order to see other people and to be seen by other people. Uh, you wear your fancy clothes and you establish yourself uh, in the social hierarchy of French society uh, by engaging in the performance, the ritual performance uh, facilitated by these spaces. And so the section through the Paris Opera is one of the paradigmatic uh, diagrams of modern social life that has come to uh, define who we are as a society and how architecture plays a role in that. Uh, it's a similar section to what you would find in Lincoln Center in New York City, but also the department stores that uh, were developed during the time in Paris as well. Uh, this student project shows that the section cut through the Paris Opera uh, shows a sequence of moving through space that doesn't end with the building. It actually starts with the boulevard uh, and continues in the building. So a more unified view of this operation, this architectural uh, performance of space is not just in the building. Uh, it, uh, it is very much an operation of the urban space as well. And um, you can see this in Hanoi uh, in the the opera house that we looked at, uh, if I can find it. Here it is. Uh, here's the boulevard that the French cut along uh, the bottom of this lake and centered right on the opera house. So it's a very similar diagram to the one in Paris. Uh, and indeed, uh, the writings of Gwendolyn Wright uh, point out that, uh, and our reading for this week, Paul Rabineau, they point out that the French liked to test their urban ideas uh, in the colonies and develop them there uh, for application back in France. And that was indeed one of the patterns that we find um, 
commonly in operation. Uh, all of this was influenced by the Garden City movement uh, of uh, the late 19th century. Um, Ebenezer Howard's uh, brilliant ideas about how the form of the city can have an important role to play in social arrangements and uh, the healthy interaction of different classes in society. This idea uh, was extended further in Garnier's uh, industrial city proposition. He was a Academy of Rome prize winner, went off to Rome, uh, and instead of drawing uh, Baroque facades in the Beaux-Arts manner that was popular at the time, and that was the whole intention of the Rome Prize, he uh, shook things up by envisioning what a modern city would look like if it followed the rational principles of industrial production. And so uh, he really was a pioneer of zoning. You see off to the right a, lar a vast industrial complex uh, connected by uh, rail, water, and road um, to the region and by these local roads to the historic uh, center that is expanded vastly on the principles of French uh, town planning. A rational grid of major and minor streets uh, going in different directions plus diagonals uh, in the uh, city beautiful uh, grand manner of Haussmann's Paris. And he was also one of the first people to envision what mass housing might look like if it was built of the new industrial material of uh, cast concrete. And so this, these images became uh, a very important reference point for everyone who follows in courting including our friend Le Corbusier and all the others. Uh, and so these views of a new type of housing actually came before uh, Adolf Loos, it came before the futurists, uh, and all of this uh, was a brilliant and shocking uh, leap forward in terms of visualizing the possibilities for the city. Uh, vast infrastructures, vast housing uh, and industrial areas, the port area and the city beyond, even uh, the historic, incorporating a historic core. And so this became one of the catalysts for the modern movement visualization of mass housing uh, according to rational principles. Uh, the Zeilenbau pattern of long ribbons of housing uh, that were very narrow in one dimension in order to give access to light and air uh, and this according to principles of modern hygiene, uh, but very long in the other direction in terms of creating the most efficient pattern of making the most housing for the least cost so that uh, the great benefits of modernism could be spread to the most people. Uh, the 1927 Weisenhof Siedlung was a housing exposition uh, organized in Germany by Mies van der Rohe, inviting the greatest architects of the day to build one or two houses uh, in order to show what architecture could do to make mass housing the high, of the highest standard available to workers of the lowest means. Uh, it developed uh, one of the things is the Frankfurt kitchen, the most efficient kitchen uh, that architecture could come up with, uh, partnering with industrial designers. Uh, mass production of housing in which uh, the first move was to lay down a system of rails that the cranes could uh, operate upon, and that would become the road system of the housing complex for mass-produced uh, concrete prefabricated housing. Um, and it was a very strong rhetorical uh, message from modern architecture that the old way, the clutter of the old life could be eliminated and uh, make way for a new clean living. This is a, a poster advertising uh, the housing exposition. And it wasn't just the architecture, it was also the furniture and a way of life. And 
the in this colorized postcard, it shows uh, uh, buildings created by some of our favorite architects, the heroes of the early modern movement, all showing their best uh, mass housing moves in one place. Um, and this had an influence uh, on the French ideas that they were starting to implement all over the world, including Vietnam. Uh, the literature on the French colonial effort uh, includes uh, Indochina, which is the French portion of Southeast Asia, which is inclusive of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, um, but also French Africa. And the reason we are still talking about Africa more than Asia is because the literature, uh, Paul Rabineau specifically, does a remarkable job of getting to the heart of the ideas uh, beyond the ideas of Orientalism, uh, the ideas of modernism, and really in relationship, the relationship between the ideas of modernism and the ideas of colonialism, and how do you deal with culture. And so that's why we resort to looking at Casablanca, Algiers, Rabat, uh, other parts of Morocco um, for these ideas. And so you see here Haussmann ideas of the large block uh, and the boulevard uh, becoming the armature for a modern expansion of these cities. Um, here we see something that could have come straight out of Haussmann's plan for Paris, um, but here it is a French design for the capital complex in Casablanca, Morocco, uh, Northwest Africa. And you see the unification of the architecture and the form of the city. Uh, and the architecture uh, was very much seen as a hybrid architecture under Lyotet's uh, ideas of, um, of what should happen in French Morocco. Uh, Rabineau does a great job of acknowledging this competition between uh, the modernists uh, Let's talk about Corbusier, because he seems to be the, the figure that is well known and we have access to. Corbusier and the other modernists, especially uh, the, internet, uh, the modernists associated with the Congress for the International Congress for Modern Architecture, or CAM, uh, which is the French acronym uh, for the Congress. They were very much interested in the universalization of humans, that all humans were the same and design would be part of the unification of the human race. Um, Lyotte was more interested in a specific modernism developing for every pre-existing culture and society. And so the Rabino reading was chosen in part because of how clearly he lays out this competition of ideas. Uh, it is particularly important because in many ways this competition of ideas continues to the present moment. Here we see a thin cast concrete by Auguste and Gustave Perret, uh, the pioneers of steel reinforced uh, concrete uh, that uh, was, were operating in Paris and Corbusier was a young intern in their office at the beginning of his career when he first came to Paris from Switzerland. And so this had a significant influence on uh, Corbusier. This is a project in Morocco um, that they did. Uh, one of the important themes of modernism in the colonies was that these, especially in the Mediterranean world, these stark white forms that were built through indigenous brick and stucco uh, te techniques of arched openings um, and lightweight timber ceilings very much resembled and, and resonated with the aesthetic of the white buildings uh, in the Weisenhof Siedlung and elsewhere in the modern movement. There was a, a resonance between the formal vocabulary of the modern movement and the indigenous vernaculars of the colonies. This is Lyotet's, uh, an example of Lyotet's ideas about what to do. Uh, the Medina 
is the name we associate with the traditional Islamic, very high-density, informal settlements that formed uh, throughout much of the world. And uh, the Kasbah is another name for it. Um, but the idea was to, in order to create more housing for the masses, the indigenous populations of Morocco, that new medinas would be necessary. But of course, they would not, could not be allowed to form on their own through self-building efforts and, um, and informal processes. Uh, they had to be ordered and rational in the French modern manner. And so these streets and buildings were laid out uh, at, at double the density of the European quarters. Uh, as, as Rabineau points out, uh, they were actually built at 15 times the density uh, of, the Euro of what was planned for the Europeans. Um, and so the form of these cities reflects very much the discourse that was prominent at the time um, of the idea that urban form and architecture could be an important force for rationalizing uh, these societies. And here we see in both the, um, this view and the tourist uh, poster uh, the way these are rendered, both the people, the gravestones, and the buildings of the indigenous vernacular are presented very much in a way that's resonant with the modern aesthetic. And this was actually something that was deployed against the modern movement. Uh, it was uh, the Weisenhof Siedlung was ridiculed uh, for being Arab uh, in this parody of the modern, the stark white modern form. Um, uh, in this, there was a 1931 colonial exposition in Paris the, celebrating the great accomplishments of the European powers uh, throughout the colonial world. And so these uh, grand constructions were to point to a, a glorious uh, future for European transformation of the rest of the world. Uh, here we see the proposition for the ports uh, of Casablanca, a series of uh, skyscrapers uh, along with the new port that uh, incorporated rail and water technology of the docks and the waterfront. This was actually very close to what was actually constructed in Shanghai uh, along the Bund, uh, something uh, we will look at further. Uh, but another important thing is to understand the relationship between urban form and housing types. Many of you are in the community design studio, and so the connection between the two is something you should be very much aware of. This is ex uh, an example of what is referred to in the reading as the weave, the trom. Um, the French word for weave is trom. Uh, or train, if you mispronounce it, uh, and it is uh, what is referred to uh, or associated with the architect Ecochard in the Rabinot reading. Um, and so this was very much uh, influenced by, um, a little bit by the vernacular, but really was an imposition of a universal idea of housing uh, that was not culturally specific, but very much an imposition of a European viewpoint of the modern human race and its basic universal needs uh, of all humanity. And so you see separate bedrooms uh, uh, and very much uh, kitchens in the European sense. And so, and the, as Rabineau points out, the emphasis was on quantity, uh, not the quality. Uh, uh, Lyoté before Ecochard was very much focused on developing a culturally specific, socially sensitive uh, modernism appropriate to these colonial settings. And so uh, to go along and resonate with Rabineau's idea of the specific uh, technical and specific cosmo techno-cosmopolitanism, uh, the specific intellectuals, uh, I think it is useful to consider his proposals for a specific modernism, uh, modernism that is specific to a 
a culture or a place. Um, and here we see this French weave that is not specific to culture or place or minimally specific to culture and place being superimposed on plans for the transformation of the Moroccan city. Uh, this brings us uh, to the example, this gives us a framework for, for looking at the example in, uh, in Indochina uh, or Vietnam. Um, the French idea was to establish a norm, and this is, uh, the, the word norm is often, um, is a very useful word because it refers to this attitude of architects and, and colonial uh, officers to establish social standards uh, that to guide the lives of the subject population. And so the, once a term, once what is normal is defined or what should be, then the architecture can proceed in order to help establish that norm uh, through its forms. Thus the title for this, um, for this lecture. Uh, it involved the civic structures. Uh, uh, here we have uh, another, it could be in Paris, but it's actually um, in Vietnam. It was most likely designed by someone who never left Paris, uh, someone from the School of Beaux-Arts who would design it and send off the drawings and it would be built in Vietnam uh, without uh, any strong connection without ad adaptation to the place. Um, and here we see multiple examples of these constructions. Uh, the infrastructure of warehouses was very much a part of the standard warehouse forms um, appropriate to industrial production, given the fact that the primary function of the colonies was the rapid and efficient moving of products, uh, especially raw materials, from a vastly expanded hinterland. It used to be that the farmland around Paris was the hinterland, but now the whole world uh, was increasingly becoming Europe's hinterland. And so the ports uh, areas were very much a part of this. Uh, the architects and planners would design these cities in order to facilitate the rapid movement of goods, but also uh, to establish a, a sense of a civilizing mission. And this was especially true of the French. They felt, uh, as mentioned at the beginning, uh, an ethical obligation to spread the civilization of Europe throughout the rest of the world uh, and the benefits of that civilization. And to justify this colonial operation, uh, the cities and architecture were very much a part of the message to the local population, to the French population, and to the rest of the world to justify uh, and rationalize this vast project. Um, and so we see uh, throughout uh, the colonized world this the operation of this architecture as a very clear sending of a message. Uh, back in Hanoi, we see uh, the ambitions of uh, the French replanning of Hanoi. The, the black areas to the right uh, along the river are the traditional tube house neighborhoods of the original fishing village of Hanoi, uh, one of the oldest settlements in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then you see the radiating uh, boulevards coming off of the new civic center of the French expansion of Hanoi. And you see signs of this pattern that we recognize from Paris uh, all over. Uh, and so the darker areas are largely left to their own devices, uh, except that s new streets are cut through these neighborhoods and the um, the, the area labeled French concession along the waterfront, uh, the fortress, um, are very much uh, up for grabs and open for redevelopment. And so we tear down the pagoda and, and raise the church. 
um, uh, tourism becomes a big part of this, and as does conservation of certain chosen specific uh, monuments. And here we have Angkor Wat in Cambodia, also part of uh, Indochina. Uh, the tourist visit uh, of the Europeans visiting Angkor Wat. Uh, we see uh, one of the market streets. Uh, this could very well be that same street that uh, in the original photograph. Uh, you see certain hybrid formations start to show up um, in the, along this development. But for the most part, the imposition of a European architectural fabric on a very non-European landscape. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the Angkor Wat uh, temple is not rebuilt in Cambodia, but uh, it is uh, emulated and uh, copied for um, the 1931 colonial exposition in Paris. Uh, really a celebration of these indigenous cultures uh, at the same time as uh, justifying the colonial project in part by uh, supporting the argument that the Europeans are the ones best positioned to understand the remnants of the past and to represent the past to the indigenous population. Um, because of their scientific rational approach to archaeological digging and the scientific rational approach to cultural studies. And so the French are uniquely qualified to understand um, the uh, indigenous culture. Um, and this is also very much a part of what we see uh, in the proliferation of historic um, conservation uh, throughout the world.